Hello, and welcome to Horrific Tales. In this show, we like to celebrate the creations of independent authors and aspiring writers. Please like, subscribe, and share these videos to help get our friends as much exposure as possible. We'd also appreciate it if you could support our artists by following them on their independent platforms and by purchasing their works. Details on how to do so will be in the show notes. Today's horrific tale is brought to us by Katie Marie. Come join us as we read to you, Frank. You know, you could have more help, I say, intentionally making my voice flat so as not to sound too keen. We could help you get a flat and get you off the street. You'd be safer, and with a permanent address, you'd be able to get a bank account, a consistent income. Things would be better for you. I hold my breath. You are very sweet, dear, Hattie says, her wrinkled fingers darting rapidly over the hem of her gaudy yellow coat, reaching in and out of her pockets before coming back to the hem. But my Frank doesn't like me being around people. It's not safe. Not safe. You'd be safer than you are on the street. I reach out for her hand, but she flinches back. I lower my hands, my lips pinched tight. Oh no, you misunderstand, Hattie says, not meeting my eyes. I don't worry about me. It's the others I'm worried about. I'm fine. She's already shuffling towards the door. Don't push her, Rebecca says when I collapse back into my chair behind reception. The last time someone pushed her, she stayed away from us for over a month. At least this way we can help a bit, monitor her, make sure she eats something, if nothing else. Hmm, I mutter and stare out the window at the graying sky. She needs help. You know she still talks about Frank in the present tense. She's always done that, Rebecca says. He was a, a big part of her life. I imagine it's hard for her to let go. That's a polite way of saying he was an abusive asshole, I snap. He's long dead now. Rebecca says. He can't hurt her anymore, and we're helping her the best we can. I snort. She's cold, alone, and clearly has mental health problems. But hey, at least she's had a sandwich. Big help we are. Don't be like that. Rebecca mumbles, her hand coming to rest on my shoulder. A gentle warmth I can feel through my clothes. We do what we can. Sometimes we're limited by funding, sometimes by rules. And sometimes people only want a certain type of help. We do what we can. I sigh loudly and pull myself up, reaching out to my computer to make a start on the reordering. The rest of my afternoon passes slowly. I try to focus on the work, but my thoughts often wander to Hattie, especially as the sky clouds over and thunder rumbles. By the time the workday is finished and I'm done helping Rebecca lock up, the rain has gone from a drizzle to a torrential storm. You okay driving in this? Rebecca asks. I'll be fine. It's not far. My smile is strained, and Rebecca doesn't look convinced. I lift a magazine over my head and flee to my car. The reduced visibility makes me drive slowly, and it's a blessing as I never would have spotted her if I hadn't been crawling along. My headlights skim over her when I turn a corner, a flash of her bright yellow coat underneath the sopping pile of cardboard. I recognize the coat immediately and pull over. Hattie! I shout over the roar of the rain, wind, and passing cars. She doesn't respond. Hattie! My voice is shrill. She still doesn't respond. Unearthing her from the cardboard makes my fingers turn numb with cold. She's unconscious, and even in the dim light and the rain, I can still see the bruise on her cheek and the blood running down from her hair. Shit! It takes a few tries but I hoist her up as best I can, one of her arms over my shoulders and my arm around her waist. Dear? Her voice is snatched away by the wind. She tenses in my grip. It's me, Hattie. Only me. I stumbled us back across the road to my car. Horns blare around us. Where are we going? Her words are slurred. I'm taking you to the hospital. Someone has hurt you. Hattie comes alive in my arms. No. She jerks, frantically trying to escape me. No, 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 no. I can't go to the hospital. Shh. I tighten my hold, my numb fingers slow to respond. I'll drop her if she keeps us up. Okay, okay. But you can't stay out here. Not tonight. Come home with me. Just you? Hattie says, 
her struggles easing. Just me, I reassured. I feel her relax a little more. Okay, he might not mind just you. The words come out as a breath, her strength fading. I fumble with the door to the car and help her inside. Heading round to the driver's side, my entire body is shaking, though from cold or fright I can't tell. Do you know who did this to you? I ask, starting the engine and turning the heating as high as it will go. Frank, she whispers. It wasn't Frank, I shake my head. It was, Hattie insists. Frank passed away years ago, I say through chattering teeth. You think he'd let a little thing like death keep him from me? She barks a laugh. You're even more naive than I was. I drive us the rest of the way to my flat, parking in the car park beneath the building. Hattie is stiffened up on the short drive, and getting her out of the car is difficult. Fortunately, the building has a lift, so we don't need to contend with stairs. Once inside, I turn on the lights and sit Hattie in my kitchen. We need to get you dry, I say as we both drip onto the kitchen floor. I lift her fringe to see if I can see the wound on her head, but I can't see any cut. The bleeding seems to have stopped. Standing back, I frown at her, uncomfortable at how out of it she seems. Thoughts of a possible concussion cross my mind. She is shaking badly. And warm. Do you think you can manage a bath if I help? That... That sounds nice, dear, but don't go to any trouble. I really should just go. Nonsense, I say, firmer than I mean to. Just stay here. I'll run a bath. As the water is running, I change my own clothes and look out something for Hattie to wear. I fill a tub with warm water, aware that properly hot water will hurt if she is as cold as she looks. Helping Hattie peel the sopping clothes off her is unsettling, as I realize just how small and frail she is under the armor of coats, cardigans, and skirts. The wet clothes probably weigh more than she does. Once she is settled in the bath and her clothes are in the wash, I make a start on dinner. Dear? She calls as I put lasagna in the oven. Coming. I hurry to the bathroom and help her rinse out her hair and get out of the bath. Where am I? She starts as I help her into some of my clothes. In the wash, I say. I'll pop them in the dryer when the cycles finish. They'll be done soon, don't worry. I usher her into the living room and sit her on the sofa, then hand her some paracetamol and a glass of water. There's a lasagna in the oven. It should be ready in half an hour. You're very sweet, Hattie mumbles, not meeting my eyes. But I really can't stay. But you can't go, I sigh. It's awful outside. At least stay until the rain stops. You don't understand. Hattie looks up at me, her eyes watery. The longer I am here, the more danger you're in. I'm not forcing you to stay, I say through my teeth, the spike of frustration in my chest undeniable. You're not a prisoner, but I don't want you to go. I'm not in any danger from anything, but you will be if you leave. You're so bloody stubborn, Hattie snaps. I flinch. I'd never heard her use such a tone before. She is normally so sweet. You won't listen. It is not safe. I hold my hands up, palms facing outwards. Hattie, I start, and the lights go out. My first thought is a power cut, but the front door slams open seconds after the lights die despite having been locked. Hattie lets out a whimper. The blow comes from behind and feels like being punched by the wind. I fall forcefully onto the coffee table, which breaks under me. The wind howls through the flat. Hattie is screaming. No, Frank, don't hurt her. Don't hurt her. It's okay. I call out to her. I'm fine. There is a horrendous crash as the television falls. Ornaments shatter and the wind howls louder. There is a gut-clenching crack followed by Hattie screaming again. Then it stops as suddenly as it had started. The sudden silence is oppressive. I can't see anything. All I can hear is my breathing and Hattie's whimpers. The lights flicker back on and I can survey the damage. The living room is in shambles. Everything not bolted down is upturned, the furniture, the ornaments, even the carpet is torn up at the corners. Hattie huddles on the floor next to the sofa, cradling her arm. I crawl over to her, ignoring the pain in my knees and my hip. Hattie, I say, are you alright? She says nothing. I put my hand on her gently and she looks up at me, 
uncurling enough to let me see her obviously broken arm. I warned you, she whispers, her skin pale and sweaty, her breathing shallow and rapid. We need to get you to the hospital, I say. She rocks her head, closing her eyes. This isn't a debate, I say firmly. Your wrist is broken badly. We need a doctor. There's a walk-in clinic, she whispers, wobbling where she sits. I half expect her to throw up. I've used it before. They know me. Leaving the living room in shambles and turning the oven off, we head out of the flat. The front door looks like someone has kicked it in. The wood around the lock is splintered. Fortunately, my neighbor was in the hall having heard the noise. What happened? He asks. Not sure, I say, encouraging the still hesitant Hattie out of the flat. My friend's badly hurt. Take her to the hospital, my neighbor says. I'll get in touch with the building caretaker and we'll get your place secured. I'll keep the key for you. Thank you. I smile at him. There's a lasagna in the oven. You can take if you want it. That's fine. You don't owe me anything, he says as we head towards the lift. He likes you, Hattie says, trembling against me. He's nice, I say. Be careful, she mutters. They're all nice in the beginning. Then, before you know it, you're letting them break your arm. Frank used to hurt you, I say. He still does. Hattie looked at her wrist like she didn't even feel it. Frank is dead, Hattie. I breathe. She looks at me, her face tight and hard. Once in the car, I consider heading to the hospital. Walk-in clinic be damned. But I want Hattie to trust me. I want to help her. So, I go to the clinic. A 24-hour walk-in clinic is a rarity these days so it doesn't surprise me to see this one is packed, despite the weather and the late hour. I help Hattie inside, a short walk from the car to the entrance drenching us. Hattie tenses as we walk in. I didn't think there would be this many people, she whispers. It's okay, I say as softly as I can. I can feel her slowing down, pulling back against my guiding hand. She is going to panic. We'll get you seen quickly and be out in no time. I expect it to be true. I expect us to get referred to the hospital the minute I go to reception. A walk-in clinic cannot deal with this. My words fall on deaf ears, however, and Hattie tries to turn. I tighten my grip and she pulls harder, trying to twist away. No! She all but screams. I can't be here. It's not safe. You're hurt. I keep my voice low and level. It's perfectly safe here. I promise. No one here will hurt you. We need to help you. Are you all right? A receptionist calls over. She has her phone lifted and is watching me closely. No, I admit. Hattie had a fall today. Her arm is broken, but she, she needs to go to a hospital, the receptionist says. I know, but it took all I could do to get her to come here. Hattie continues to fight me, howling out her objections. Even though I am stronger and taller than her, and she is obviously in an incredible amount of pain, it takes all my strength to hold her. We can help the anxiety, the receptionist says, waving down a strong-looking chap in a security uniform. The doctor can give her something to calm her down. Then we'll call the hospital and see if we can get a paramedic out as well. Thank you so much. The sudden relief of not having to manage this on my own leaves me giddy. It's not safe, Hattie screams as the security man approaches to help her into the clinic properly. Another joins him, and together they take her from me. I follow as they take her into one of the small treatment rooms. Hattie looks at me, her eyes wide, tears falling. It's not safe, she whimpers. Let me go, he'll be so angry. You'll be fine, I try to soothe. I'll be right here, I won't leave you, I promise. It's not safe, she yells again. Frank is coming. Who's Frank? A nurse asked me as the security men secure Hattie to the bed. He was her husband. I pause. He's been dead for a long time. She thinks he did this. The nurse looks at me silently for what feels like a long time before speaking. It's probably better that you wait here a moment, she says, putting a cool hand on my arm. They'll give her something to calm her and we'll let you back in. But she's frightened, I stutter. And you'll be in the way. It'll go faster if you just wait here won't be a moment. The nurse is firmer this time. All right, I back off. I'll nip to the toilet then. 
Once I closed the toilet door, I let her breath out I didn't realize I'd been holding. My entire body shakes. I stumble to the sink and turn on the cold tap, trying to splash cold water on my face. But all I do is make a mess. Deciding this is useless, I turn to head back outside, but I trip over my shaking feet. As I hit the ground, a sound not unlike the roar of wind that had raced through my apartment rises. The toilet door shakes in the frame and I cover my ears as the roar grows louder and louder. I can hear people screaming. I'm on my feet and at the door a moment later. I try to open it, but something stops me. The door is stuck. You stay put, I hear Hattie say, despite the howling wind. For a second, I wonder how she got away from the nurses. She says something else, but I can't hear it over the sound of chaos and people screaming. Hattie, I shout to be heard. Let me out! But she doesn't. I pound on the door as the wind roars louder. The walls shake as something big and heavy is hit. The screaming continues, the voices cutting off one by one. My voice is hoarse and my throat raw when the screaming outside the door eventually stops. I am on my knees when the door finally opens. I clamber to my feet and step out of the toilet, slipping in the blood splattered over the floor. I stumble my way out to reception. The room is destroyed. Broken bodies slump over, under, and through equally broken furniture. The walls are cracked and splattered with blood. In amongst the destruction stands something that looks like a man. He's huge and translucent. I can see right through his back to the devastation in front of him. His arm is around Hattie, who looks at me over her shoulder, tears streaming down her face. I tried to warn you, she whispers. Frank doesn't like me being around other people. Well, we hope you enjoyed our latest horrific tale. If you'd like to keep up to date, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube page. Also, follow us on our social media pages. You can also show your support for the channel by going to our merchandise store, picking up some items there. Please also take a moment to support our contributing friends who kindly lend their talents to this show. Check out the links in the description as to how you can do this. Until next time, keep it creepy, keep it horrific. <laughs>